Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, the skyscraper dweller two districts over who is looking out of the window and saying, hey honey, is it just me or is that cloud of aggressive white blobs getting kind of close? And before we dive in today, I just want to mention I'm getting really close to 100 subscribers. Um, that's an important milestone, not just because it makes me feel good, like in my validation center of my brain, but also because if I hit 100 subscribers, YouTube unlocks the ability for you to have a custom channel name rather than your, you know, URL being like youtube.com forward slash adapts 9 which is obviously just not great for branding. Anyway, so uh, if you can find it in your hearts to share my videos, if you think they're good, I know it's a hassle, but if you just, you know, if you think my work is good, please share it with people. I'd love to hit that milestone. Anyway, let's go. So as uh, you can, well, let's see what this says. 200 meter visibility. So it, it's rendering the world into into ashes as we move. Anyway, um, so today we'll be heading off to fight the next boss and assorted things on the way to the next boss. So um, here's a fun detail. You know how fetch summons a dog? Well, um, if you slot Spark, which, you know, splits your abilities into Fetch, you uh, get two dogs. Da -da -da double dog. As we all know, two dogs is always better than one dog. I think any dog owner will um, happily attest to that fact. Although I have, of course, given myself no real attack abilities to get through this combat sequence, I'm just going to have to rely on, on two Luna. Which, uh, shout out to my buddy, is in fact, yeah, that is Luna, isn't it? Uh, the yellow dog from the back door where, where uh, Sybil presumably enjoyed having a pet, which is understandable. But they don't, why aren't they attacking? Good girls, nice, very good. So throughout this whole chase sequence, you're running up the side of this site skyscraper, dodging these strikes from the uh, from the spine of the world, peculiarly named, but um, I think there's something interesting about the spine, which is that unlike all of the rest of the process, which had this... Off. I think it took off. All of the rest of the process have this, like, very smooth... Yeah, buddy, you did. Oh, honey, I've been where you are. Anyway, well, I'll talk about that in a second, I just want to rearrange my functions. Because now that I've shown you two dogs, I never want to use two dogs again, simply because it does not fit my playstyle. There's nothing wrong with having two dogs, although I guess it's a little bit selfish if it means someone else only has one dog. Yeah, so, let's move on. Uh, this point of the world... Settling every big decision in this town. Yeah. The and their strings. So... Again, it's not clear. Are the Camerata some kind of secret society pulling the strings from behind the scenes? Do they have a public face, but uh, nobody knows they control everything? Or, well, any other further thing of that nature? I'll talk about the tale in a second. Veracity of finding is 91%. Hey, at least if we get through this, we'll get to say we were there. Monstrosity attacks bracket towers. Eyewitness reports confirm presence of a massive organism in downtown Cloudbank. A huge serpentine creature was seen clinging to Bracket Towers South in the high-rise district early this morning, amid spreading panic and devastation caused by the process outbreak ravaging the city. Administration warns that the creature is extremely dangerous and is to be avoided at all costs. The 18th Precinct is launching a full-scale effort to draw the creature away from populated centres. Any residents remaining in high-rise are urged to leave the area immediately. Hey, it's me, it's me. Are you still there? Answer me. Look, we're going to get ourselves out of okay. this, okay? Okay. I... Yeah. Hold on, just try and hold on, alright? I'm trying. I'm trying. Hold on, you have to hold on. I'm going to... I'm going to find the thing Come that's doing up. this and I'm going to break its heart. I believe you. I love this moment because... It's such a clever way to kind of recontextualize the thing you've been doing all along but also she can't speak how can she communicate with him Hello. so I love that tiny little detail 
that she might use that convenient moment to to try and talk I to him. But it also reinforces the creeping horror nothing. of um, in the previous right sequence, now, where your sword starts to wonder if you can even hear what he's no, been saying all along. I do love this idea. This is a world that operates on computing logic, after all. So, perhaps, yeah, perhaps having a um, sufficiently large enough creature, it's eating up all of the memory in this area. occupying all of the processing power and uh, there's nothing anyone can do about it. So he's literally running slower because of that thing I just said. Now these are a pain to fight because uh, now that they've gotten to the next level they've got the ability to go invisible and um, the way this game adjudicates invisibility is that it's actually immunity. I'm going to keep all these the same. Um, so, when those dogs go invisible, even if you know where they are and you use an AoE attack, uh, the damage you do doesn't affect them. It's gone to the country. There's that term again, going to the country, except he's intentionally using it ironically this time. So is that an idiom used by the people of this city, or... Is there a place outside this city? It's very ambiguous this whole time whether or not this city is the extent of their world. We're sorry, this terminal has suffered an unknown problem and needs to restart. Restarting? If we don't move it, we'll be worse than this terminal. Why bother? I think we have bigger issues. So, again. yeah, take a look again at that tail, because, um... You might notice that it actually looks nothing like the rest of the process. The process as a whole have this very kind of uh, smooth, sleek, rounded, bulbous iPhone design. Almost all of them have, even the ones that have spiky bits, have very smooth, organic, rounded spikes. But the tail of the spine of the world, it's actually reflecting hey, more of the... Want to hear a funny joke? Sure, go for it. What's the difference? Never mind. But I want to hear the joke. Well, Talk anyway. Uh, the design of the tail reflects this, like, complicated, detailed, ornate... Um, the uh, Art Deco and Art Nouveau blend that is the, the mark of human infrastructure throughout the entire game. So why does the spine of the world look so different to all of the rest of the process? The rest of the process universally look... Are we there yet? ...like rounded, smooth, apple-style designs. Red, wait. Why is Please this one... Be. Why is this one in particular so much larger? Anyway, this is the loadout that I want to take into the battle. Um, or at least I think it is. So let's go. Oh dear. It's also the only one that shows any kind of any kind of different color casing on the external parts of it. If you see every other one, they have these rounded bits, and you can occasionally peek through the casing, see little, you know, um, chinks in their armor, little gaps that you can see through. But it's um, it's the spine of the world that has this weird, you know, black fur on it, and um, it's weird Gustav Klimt patterned tail and asymmetric eyes, and 
I don't know if they ever give any kind of reasoning behind that. I don't know if it's supposed to represent some kind of evolution of the process as a concept, or if all of the process, if this large, would look like that. It's intentionally mysterious, like so much else. Now, what I want to know is, do enemy attacks break my uh, packet exploders? Because if that's the case, it'd make it a little easier to do damage, because I can just run around and leave them. So I intentionally took the um, loyalty flip upgrade as my um, passive upgrade for this fight, because I knew that it would spit out an absolute ton of uh, cells, and when you have that upgrade, if you grab a cell, what happens? Well, you spawn an allied cell. Ah, oh, breach. I needed that. Anyway, so it spawns a ton of allies, which actually can do a lot of damage if they spawn in the right place and all shoot at once. Uh, on my practice run, I made it through without taking any damage, but it is harder to do this if you are also talking at the same time. This is just a fact that everybody knows. Ah, oh, beans, I've got to uh, detonate them. I think there's actually a finite amount of time before a, uh, a packet detonates, but this should finish it off. If it triggers, which it didn't for some reason. There we go. Explode your foes for glorious vengeance. This is where the only time one actually leaves a corpse. All of the rest of them just explode and disintegrate. So again, why is the nature of this one different to the others? It's also usually thought of as being serpentine, but as you can see, it clearly has... That was the head on top of a torso, and it's got arms out to either side. It's almost a kind of, like, vast god beast. And here we climb inside, and we get a total perspective change, one of the first in the game. There's a couple of interesting things about this. One is that it's gone to this very abstract pattern place. This is the strongest influence of Klimt, the strongest klimt fluence, if you will. Um, in the entire game, because this almost looks like a Klimt painting. And, um... It's so curious, as we go in here and we see this, which is also much more the style used in the uh, art for the limiters, which is very different to the art in the rest of the game. This one, which adds a damage over time effect. I'm also going to grab um, additional memory so that I can slot more functions. Among other things. What's that supposed to mean? So yeah, a lot of a lot more unanswered questions in this. A game full of unanswered questions and strangenesses, but um. It's a pretty easy nice. fight, all things considered. I guess I missed the good part. And the main thing for me is that kind of total perspective change. Uh, in the original designs for this game, when you were supposed to go uh, to the access points and upgrade your, so upgrade your sword, you, what you were actually doing was climbing inside your sword and descending into a kind of sub-world within it, within its own memory. Um, they decided to remove that from the designs, but during those moments, you would... Uh, sort of retreat into the backdrop and walk in that 2D way as a silhouette. So it's nice that they kept that little detail in for the sake of the spine of the world, um, like, post-boss moment. So with that, we should have, hopefully, unlocked a couple new stories, which I will read in just a moment. I'll just finish um, fiddling with my stats. Because remember, you should never fiddle with your stats where people can see you. Let's have a look at these. 
Bailey Gillande, age 32, gender X, acquisition and statistics, reasons cited to shape the present and the past. Ms. Bailey Gillande was never one to follow the pack. Due to a variety of social challenges she experienced early on, she grew to care much more about the past than the future. While this preoccupation at first made her reclusive as a person, in time it flourished as an invaluable skill, which put her at the forefront of a movement to fundamentally rework the city's outdated and incomplete archival system. Then, one day, Miss Gillande received a message from her local admin branch, extending her a pre-approved opportunity to be the head of City Archives. She accepted on the spot. Miss Gillande's propensity to look at and find the truth in historic fact patterns made her excel at evaluating possible decisions about the future. She was well regarded for her objectivity and fairness. Any time a new civic initiative was proposed, Miss Gillande would cite relevant historical data that put the initiative in context, and ultimately let those involved move forward with confidence. She became one of the administration's top consultants. So, in spite of her demeanor, she was not surprised when she received an invitation to a private banquet in honor of individuals who gave the most to Cloudbank. Miss Gillande's surprise came later when she arrived at the site of the banquet to discover the event was only in her honor and that it was not a banquet at all. The camerata identified Miss Gillande as having a wealth of knowledge about the city's inner workings and an agreeable non-confrontational attitude, which gave her success in her professional interactions. Miss Gillande led a very private life and had no significant interests outside her work, so when she failed to show up for her duties one day, her colleagues were very troubled but found no leads as to her whereabouts. She never told anyone of the banquet. So obviously the main takeaway from this is that it is yet more evidence that the camerata are disappearing people who contribute greatly to the society so that they can be incorporated into its texture or its framework in some greater way. However, I also just want to point out the dissonance of um, the gender X implies that this person might be non-binary, but this game came out before the kind of huge push for uh, mainstream recognition of non-binary identities that has happened in the last few years even. Um, like even six or seven years ago, the public profile of non-binary identity of non-binary identity was way less known. Like if you were in queer communities, you knew non-binary people, but you weren't seeing non-binary people on the news or whatever. So it's interesting that they then still go with um, traditional pronouns throughout that. If you wanted to be inclusive, I mean, there are plenty of non-binary people who use traditional pronouns one way or another. Um, but it's just interesting that they chose to make that character's gender X, but then still have her be referred to with feminine pronouns throughout. Wave Tenegan, age 40, gender M. Selections, awareness, and debate. Reasons cited? Big ideas, that's why. I'm delighted by the way this guy's design reflects the kind of archetypical capitalist, which is strange because it's not really what <laughs> it doesn't really reflect uh, his character. But when I look at that picture, I think of. Um, I think of Disney and parodies of Disney that have showed up in so many video games. Your Andrews Ryan, your Mr's House. Anyway, Wave Tenegan. Mr Wave Tenegan traded the quiet life of a sanctuary vicar to become one of Cloudbank's biggest alternative broadcast personalities for his distinct blend of good-natured mannerisms and incisive social commentary. Straddling the generational boundary between the old guard and the new, Mr Tenegan offered a canny perspective on the many factors influencing the city's evolution. But during one of his many meet and greet events with his listeners, he met a group of individuals who would forever change the course of his life. That evening, after his event drew to a close, Mr. Tenegan met members of the group calling themselves the Camerata. They invited Mr. Tenegan to come and see what was really going on in his city, as long as Mr. Tenegan promised not to disclose any facts concerning the existence of the group. Mr. Tenegan outwardly accepted, for his curiosity could not be quenched. But he inwardly refused, for his commitment to his listeners precluded the keeping of secrets. First, he would meet the camerata on their terms. As far as anyone knew, Mr. Tenegan took some personal time as one day his broadcast simply stopped. He had never missed a day of broadcasting in his life, and so his listeners, while disappointed, were very understanding and both happy and concerned for him. A significant majority believed Mr. Tenegan finally took a break, as he often promised he would one day. Since then, Mr. Tenegan's young producer inherited his show, though listenership has steadily declined to bottom out at just 22% of Mr. Tenegan's average. So again, a lot more texture and detail added to this world, um, but very much in keeping with the sort of 20s, 30s theming. He's a broadcaster. He's not a TV personality. Um, and although early TV presenters were called broadcasters, and still are some t uh, in some contexts, it's very much something you associate with the early days of radio. 
Anyway, that's going to be all from me to t for today. I hope you enjoyed this. I'll catch you later. If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements, and one-tweet micro-reviews, or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi, or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.